I'm Adrian Nolan Smith, I'm founder of Wellbe, and I'm really excited today to introduce Dr. Ellen Vora to you. Um, Ellen and I happen to be neighbors in the same apartment building, which is totally <laughs> random, and met uh, recently. And it's very exciting for me to have her on the show today because she's an integrative psychiatrist. She's uh, board certified by the prestigious Columbia University, but she's also um, a licensed acupuncturist and yoga teacher. And the topic of integrative psychiatry is really important to me at Wellbe for a couple of different reasons, but if you've seen the video that's on our site right now about my mother's experience, she had been diagnosed for five years with schizoaffective disorder and was sort of revolving door of um, mental hospitals until uh, she passed away in 2010. But a lot of what I had believed to be missing in her care is exactly what Ellen practices today. So for many reasons, this is um, really, really exciting for me. So I have a couple of different um, really exciting things to talk about with Ellen. Um, the first of which is, do you ever get to practice psychiatry, acupuncture, and yoga therapy on patients at the same time? Uh, so yeah, I think it does come together sometimes. I would say the thing that comes up least in my practice would be yoga. Um, I always, when I was pursuing all of these different trainings at the same time, psychiatry residency, acupuncture training, and yoga, I was always thinking like, how the heck is this going to come together? But I just was like, just keep going forward and we'll figure it out. And um, it turns out that yoga, it's more like an overriding philosophy that I bring to my practice. And sometimes I'll recommend that people do yoga. Sometimes I'll bring up things like the yamas and the niyamas from yoga philosophy as just a way of having, it's, it's almost like a yoga cognitive behavioral therapy. So I have people look at those tenets and start to think about that in terms of their care. But very rarely are we like busting out triangle pose <laughs> in a session. Um, but certainly acupuncture and psychotherapy and psychiatry, that's all coming together in a session. And I don't do acupuncture with every patient, but for a lot of patients, um, it can look like somebody is actually like on the table with needles in and we're doing psychotherapy while they're lying there with needles in. And for other patients, it's more like we talk for half hour, 45 minutes, and then we switch over to acupuncture. Okay. Wow, that's really interesting because you know a lot of psychiatrists today are not acupuncturists or yoga certified. So yeah. it's pretty unique and yeah. I think pretty cool. I hope more over time. Yes. I think that yes. it's, it's a growing field and it should get a lot bigger. It's a natural fit. Yeah, mm. cool. Um, so just to spout off some statistics about mental health and mental illness um, that's relevant to the conversation, I think it's about one in five American adults suffer from some kind of mental illness, mm -hmm. and the most popular of which are anxiety and depression. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what have you seen in your patients, in your practice to be, and I guess in your research as well, the most common cause of anxiety and depression? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> as if there's one thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, I'm sure it's a million, but just if it's something that's, yeah. you know, we, we didn't already know. Yeah, it's almost like, it depends on what day you catch me and it's like, you know, what I'll decide to be sensationally all in on. It's like one day I'll be like, it's all about insomnia, or I'll say like, it's all about gut inflammation. And these days I'm feeling more like, it's the lack of community and isolation and just how everyone is so far afield from like how we evolved to live and people aren't grounded and connected in positive communities. And, um, you know, I feel like you could even de-emphasize gut health and inflammation and like even sleep a little bit if someone had that going for them, like balance in their life and a strong community. So I think all of these things are playing a really big role. The thing I don't think it is, is like an Zoloft deficiency disorder. I don't right. think that people are really born with that and that we just happen to live at a time where we have a perfect medication to treat this genetic issue. I, I think that it's so much more complicated. I think genetics play a role, but that's just, that's what they, they play a role. Um, genetics are, I think of it much more like a predisposition. Um, and then there's always an environmental influence and that can be right. everything from how you're eating or how you're sleeping or whether your gut ecology is out of balance all the way to like are you burned out and stressed in your life are you grounded in a positive community do you have good relationships so it all matters right um, but today i think my feeling is social isolation okay. is number one <laughs> that's that's fine i i think uh you can correct me if i'm wrong but recently 
a lot of research has come out about how much your environment um, affects your genetics. You know, we all sort of have predispositions to different things and then what we do and our lifestyles and the environment around us really seems to affect that quite a bit. So yeah. the brain should be no different, right? Yeah. Yeah. So epigenetics is like the term. And okay. That's what you're talking. That's what we're talking about. I yeah. Guess. And I mean, if you haven't yet, you know, like go read Wikipedia about it. Cause it's really something that first of all, like your brain makes these new connections as soon as you understand this concept and it's sort of really eye opening, but it's what's all important when we think about, um, how to think about health and building health. My, I've always thought in terms of, so I have a, a daughter and we think about um, this concept of growth mindset versus fixed mindset. So fixed mindset is like when you tell a kid like, um, good girl, you're so smart. And like, it seems like a nice compliment, right? But then that kid grows up to think like, I'm smart. And so then when you get to your like 11th grade calculus class and you struggle, you're like, I must not be this smart. And there's no real motivation to work harder and try to figure out a problem and get better at it because you're just like, I'm smart. It's natural, inherent, just aptitude. So it's like, it's not about hard work. It's not about being resourceful or resilient. It's just like, you're smarter, you're not one zero. And so a growth mindset would be like, um, you worked really hard at that. And you know, I know it can be frustrating, but you're figuring it out. And so it promotes like that hard work and trying to take a different tack. And that growth mindset, like I get it with child rearing. And what I'm starting to realize with health is that we all walk around with this fixed mindset about health. We think like it's genetic, like you're born with the, the that's the card, you know, the hand, the, what is it? The, the hand, the that, you're hand that you're dealt. Yeah. You, you walk around like with the hand that you're dealt. Those are your genes. That's your DNA. And, and that's what you get. And maybe you're supposed to get cancer or maybe you're supposed to have mental illness and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's like, you know, it's a little bit scary, but it's also kind of a tempting, like seductive way of thinking about things because it takes the responsibility off of us. Right. There's no agency in that. It's just like, that's the hand you're dealt and there's nothing you can do about it. So you might as well like go have like, you know, McDonald's or whatever. And it's not going to change. Yeah. Or just take this pill and like, just yeah, do that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you have the disease that's designed for this pill. Right. And oh, like, right. Exactly. And actually another question I had related to that was when people say, oh, it's just a chemical imbalance. There's nothing you can do about it. For, you know, uh, speaking about mental illness, I, I never really know what to say to that. What do you say to that? I'm sure people say that to you. All the time, yeah. So there's a pill for that? Yeah, I mean, so that's that's the mindset that we've been, it's been marketed to us and we all like, like that idea. It's so easy. It's like, oh, there's a pill for that. Like you don't have to do anything more. It's not about exercising or eating in a certain way. It's just like you take this pill. But I think a bit of that has had to do with the direct to consumer um, advertisements that happen. So we've really been conditioned as a culture, for this narrative that like um, you have a chemical imbalance in your brain and there's a pill to correct that. And there were really effective advertisements. Like in the 90s, there was that so loft one with these cute little cartoon bubbles that were like, you know, here's your serotonin in the synapse. And so we all like were, you know, we sort of came of age in this era where it's like there's a pill for that. And um, so to have somebody see a different paradigm of how mental health works it's a struggle um, yeah. but you know I think that once you start to think like oh like it's that's true we probably I probably wasn't born with Zoloft deficiency disorder maybe there are other factors that contribute to mental health that's when people start to see that, that there's a different way yeah so it's, it's the growth mindset like you can start to realize your health isn't just like DNA and fixed it's like oh you can change your environments, you can change the way you're eating, the way you're sleeping, the way you're moving, your community, and that starts to affect your mental health. So it's really it's kind of a hopeful way of looking at it. Yeah, for sure. And definitely plays into the idea of um, the body being a whole systems, you know, and each system being connected. And so you have to sort of do everything on each level to make sure that you have a nice hole. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's interesting how in Western medicine, everything is like a discrete separate thing. It's like, you know, that's your liver, that's your kidney, that's your brain. Like, and, and never the two shall meet. Like these are separate things. Um, every time a Western medically trained person like me learns Chinese medicine or like Ayurveda where it's, they're thinking about it as these systems and there's a web of interconnection. Every Western person goes through the same kind of like, like, oh, this is a really different way to think about health, you know? Yeah. It's sort of like, what do you mean my kidney is also in my ankle? You know? Right. <laughs> but that's, you know, the way to think about it, that there are these systems and they're sort of all communicating with each other. Once you go there, you're like, oh, well, yeah, of course. 
but and then you look back at Western medicine and to think that any part of the body is discrete and and separate from the rest is actually kind of it doesn't even make sense to me anymore yeah I think I've gotten there too yeah um, so you mentioned the different systems in the body and the things that can affect the brain and um, a little bit of like insomnia and, and certainly if there was inflammation in the brain you could see how that could affect mental health um, stress as well but the thing that's the most interesting I think right now is how much the microbiome and the gut is affecting the brain and I think a lot of research that's come out in the last I guess decade on the microbiome project has really made that connection to a variety of conditions but affecting the brain I think it's Alzheimer's and dementia and a couple of other ones that I'm sure yeah. you can tell us more about but you know what what has that done for your practice and the field of psychiatry altogether. Yeah, so certainly like the microbiome, the way, or I just use that as shorthand for like all things gut health. Um, I'm curious if like 10 years from now I'm gonna dial back this statement, but at least right now the way I feel about it is that it affects everything and it affects everything pretty profoundly. So with mental health, I mean the, the brain is actually a physical organ. So it's not like it's special and different. It's actually just like your liver, just like your kidney, it's a physical organ. So if something is off physiologically, like physically in your body, it's gonna impact your brain. And it turns out that our gut, um, we're almost in this symbiotic relationship with this diverse collection of bacteria, viruses, bacteriophages, like all these different little critters that live in our gut. And they are carrying out a lot of roles. And it's everything from, they're even synthesizing some of our neurotransmitters, which is very interesting when we think about how when someone, their gut is inflamed, they have digestive issues, and then they also have mental health issues. Um, maybe their gut isn't making serotonin or uh, GABA properly, and that might have to do with the bacteria. Um, and our gut flora is also, it's calibrating our immune system. And this, I think, is the most interesting topic of all right now, because we're sort of in this era where like in the past, the challenge was infectious disease. It's like you could get malaria, you could get typhoid, and like this was the challenge, this was the big problem. So our immune system is like this race car designed to attack like real threats to our health. And while there are still some real infectious disease threats, for the most part in like industrialized countries, like it's shifted towards um, more of an issue of immune dysregulation, where our immune system is starting to kind of fire like rogue and like hitting all the wrong things and there's an epidemic of autoimmunity so it's like our immune system has gotten confused and now we have allergies and we have eczema and we have autoimmune conditions and these are all issues of the immune system not calibrated properly so now we understand our gut flora it's those bugs in our digestive tract that are telling the immune system here's what's okay here's what's bad like when you see this freak out about this but if you see this it's okay calm down and that's what our immune systems need to be taught. And these days, it's not being taught that really properly. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've read a lot about this in a variety of, of books and, and articles, and it seems like there's a couple of things to blame. I guess a lot of overprescription of antibiotics and a lot of environmental toxins and stress and mm -hmm. um, sort of a, a lack of sleep across the board. Mm -hmm. um, so extrapolating on that some of the things that you see as most common triggers for um, different mental illnesses I think you, you mentioned um, social isolation stress gut issues yeah. um, and so how do you even start trying to treat somebody in a where do you spiral? begin yeah <laughs> yeah where do you begin I mean I think I haven't perfected that art um, it's always like I I'm I miss fire a lot too like a bad immune system right so it's like <laughs> if I it, sometimes I want to tell somebody like, okay, just do these 1,000 things and you will feel better. And they're like, uh, I'm depressed and have no motivation to get off the couch. Like, I can't do a 1,000 changes right. in my life. And then other times I try to simplify it. I'm like, okay, just do these three things. Um, and then, you know, someone puts those into practice and they're kind of like, you didn't tell me I was supposed to change like how I eat. And I was like, well, I was trying to keep it simple, but yeah. Right, yeah. So yeah, there's like, there's a lot that we can do, but the real art to this is like, what's the right rate of change? Like how should you start to make these little shifts in your behavior and your lifestyle and your diet so that it's actually doable and sustainable and not too discouraging and not overwhelming, but that you make enough of a change that you see an impact. Because it's also very frustrating to make any change and see no difference. And then it's like, okay, I tried the holistic route and it didn't work. And right. um, so people get pretty discouraged on either end of that. 
Um, but yeah, I think what I usually start with, and it's a little different for every person, but I like to start with sleep because I think that there are some, there's like low hanging fruit around sleep. Um, so many of us are exposed to light in the evenings in a way that's impacting our ability to sleep well. And so even just like little changes, like getting the phone out of the bedroom right. or um, even just making the lights in your home dimmer in the evening, even that can set you up to sleep better. And once somebody's sleeping better, everything else is easier. So like depression improves a little bit, anxiety improves a little bit, gut health improves a little bit. And then once all of those are starting to improve, it just gets easier and easier to make more changes. Mm -hmm. So I like to start with sleep, but in the background, I also want to just make sure people are making little diet changes uh, so that their gut health gets healthier, just so that they start to get the nutrition that they need to heal. Yeah, I, I can tell you personally, when we were launching Wellbe, that um, I wasn't sleeping nearly as well. I think of myself as a great sleeper, and then the spiral of feeling jazzed up and not in control of my emotions during the day was really significant. Yeah. Like I could feel the difference. And then all it took was, you know, a solid eight hours of sleep a couple of days after we had launched and everything started to return to normal. So yeah. I think it can have a crazy impact. And I know a lot of people say like, oh, well, I just don't sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I just need like four or five hours or I just can't sleep. Like they've given up on it a few decades ago or something, yeah. you know, and I'm sort of like, what you know but what i don't you know there's it's hard to say something to, to yeah yeah that. given up or even like sometimes it's a point of pride um, oh yeah like especially yeah. in a place like new york city and a few other pockets in the country it's like it, people are, are proud of being these like uber men who are like i you know i only need four to six hours of sleep and i get more out of life than the average person right oh i'll sleep when i'm dead and you're like well you may die sooner because you're not sleeping <laughs> Statistically, yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think that it's, um, yeah, we have a real, like, like, not an eating disorder, but like a sleeping disorder as a country a bit. Um, so I think we all, like, look at rest as sort of slothful or lazy or decadent or indulgent and all this. And I think, like, ideally we all just start to shift and value it and recognize, like, this is part of how you um, not only can feel healthy and feel better, but also it, like, helps us be more kind and patient and compassionate people. Like, we'd all be a little bit better off if we put some value on sleep. Right, and just restore the brain so that it can actually perform better the next day. Um, I've seen that over and over, and especially, I mean, you were a resident, right? I've seen mm. friends who have gone through medical school on so little sleep, and I then thinking of myself as if I was ever a hospital patient, I would certainly not want them yeah. taking care of me. Makes a poor choice. Dysfunctional system, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, all of these things that need to exist 24-7, like that need to run 24-7, which are things like, you know, airports and hospitals and like apparently Dwayne Reed, you know, <laughs> it's like, that's our local drugstore. Yeah, so I think that, um, I don't know the right solution, because, you know, when I was a resident, you would work these 24, but really like, 36 hour straight shifts and then these days I think it's it's moved more towards um, you're working 12 hour shifts but you're you know working either a day shift or a night shift and neither is great um, and I mean I was out of my mind when I was doing it and I always was just like scratching my head and being like this is healthcare but we don't get health right <laughs> we don't get it and I see my friends posting pictures as they're pulling these all-nighters with the candy and everything from the vending machines because you can't really get you know real food and sort of a little bit of wearing it like a badge of pride but also just like you know gosh can't believe this is health haha <laughs> and I'm like oh no disturbing you know, it's pretty disturbing my patients who like know me to be like Gwyneth Paltrow, Dr. Vora, who's like, just only have pastured, like wild, you know, wild right. game meats and, you know, organic farmer's market vegetables. And it's like, no, I would be like at the candy machine and just be like, come on, Twix bar. And it's just, yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, but the real sadness of it, it's not just the health impact on the people in training and, you know, the doctors, but then patients like it's hard to know like you can't know in what ways was that compromising your decision making or compromising your reaction time but it, we we know it was and so it's really hard to think back to like you know like what kind of impact does that have it's usually insidious it's not usually obvious but it's definitely having a negative impact on the care that's being given to patients yeah so it's really not okay but i don't have the solution <laughs> so i wanted to ask you about some of the more serious mental illnesses that affect a smaller population of Americans. But if you are a family member or you yourself have gone through any of them, specifically bipolar and mm -hmm. schizophrenia or even PTSD, um, it's just extremely traumatic. And so 
you know, I'm curious what, what you feel like is the best sort of solution, even if there really isn't one, for when somebody's gotten that far and their mental illness ends up being a big manic episode and they're, um, I think it's the term, a danger to themselves or others and therefore, you know, maybe they should be institutionalized. I can tell you from my own experience, I was sort of horrified by the mental hospitals that I saw when my mom was sick. It seemed to be the opposite of a healing environment mm -hmm. um, and it was incredibly expensive. So, you know, the two things, like you didn't even really have time to get better. And then even if you did, maybe you wouldn't have because it was so disturbing and so many, it's almost felt more like a jail. Yeah. So, you know, what do you, what do you do in that scenario? Yeah. So I definitely don't have the solution. Um, I come up against this predicament all the time with my patients. It's like, so the work that I do, like the holistic approach, that's much more useful in a more of a maintenance or prevention phase of treatments. Like if someone is depressed or anxious, or even if they are bipolar, but they're in a moment of relative stability, um, it's like, okay, let's like, let's work with diet lifestyle and like, let's get you just resilient and balanced on your own without the meds. Um, once someone's in an episode, like if they're manic or if they're in a really acute depressive episode or a psychotic episode, that's when I'm sort of faced with this predicament where it's like, okay, our options are um, like, um, okay, you're like at home, you're not safe, you're not stable, maybe you're even like in a position of being a caretaker for kids or something like that, and it's like it's really not okay for you to just be at home right now. Um, but our alternative is this system where, you know, you go through an ER or like an admissions process, um, the whole thing is very like not like the bedside manner is lacking the sort of it's not a therapeutic environment and then it's almost kind of worse once you get up to the unit if you're admitted to a psychiatric inpatient unit um, you know it's bad food it's like being woken up in the middle of the night um, it's being surrounded by people with varying levels of functioning um, and yeah I, I think it's very rarely a therapeutic environment sometimes it's even a bit of a traumatic experience for the patient and their family um, and I think it even starts to seep in and people get ideas of like who they are and it's like, okay, I'm mentally ill, like this is me now and forever and like I'm like this and I think that that story is often kind of counterproductive as well. Yeah. And so, um, but like that's the system that we have right now to ensure safety. Um, and of course, like anyone who's admitted is typically going to be pumped full of medications and it's just like, you know, you've plugged yourself into the system at that point and it's pretty challenging to really work yourself out of that system once you're in it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't have the answer. It's something that I'm up against with patients all the time. I, every once in a while will recommend like if you have a parent or a partner or a buddy, like someone who gets it and can basically put their life on hold for a period of time and be like your, you know, the equivalent of the way an inpatient unit keeps you safe, like will prevent you from doing any harm to yourself or to anybody else. And you could go to like what would be your version of a truly therapeutic environment. Um, that can be like a yoga retreat or just going camping, being in nature or like going on a beach vacation, like even something like this, this kind of intervention. Um, sometimes like if it seems like someone is stable enough and has enough of a supportive network that they can do this, then I would recommend that someone do that. It's still expensive. Some people find that an inpatient stay is fully covered by insurance. Some people find it's partially covered by insurance and it's still a big out of pocket expenditure. So like in terms of like cost, it's like sometimes you can go on this beach vacation and it doesn't end up being any more expensive than, you know, the medical treatment. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for some people who are going to be safe enough in that environment, that's, I think, a more therapeutic option. Often people just need a reset. Often people actually just need to admit that they're really not okay and they need help. And it's sort of like a crisis or an episode is a way of saying like, I can't keep doing the grind right now. It's like, I need to step out of my day-to-day -day life. And so it's sort of hearing that and honoring that need, keeping someone safe, but like in a genuinely therapeutic environment. Yeah, and I think even just, I, you know, somebody in a manic episode, once they can stabilize doing a lot of the testing that you're talking about with the gut and with these other, you know, systems in the body to, to say, oh, you know, you're going to be okay. The whole thing was this crazy parasite, yeah. you know, and just at least, you know, try to kick that and then see what's underneath. And maybe their symptoms are gone or reduced by half. And then you can start from there. Something, you yeah. know, I feel like once they that to me was such a missing part of 
my mom's care trying to understand like the root cause or just like investigate the gut you know it wasn't even like on the radar yeah you know? and yeah even still I mean it's like the rare person for whom it is on the radar it's like we don't have a narrative for understanding like that mental illness has a root cause and it could be physical um, we still like even my patients who are like plugged into this like Dr. Vora system of kind of like like let's think about mental health in a different way um, I'll even hear them say expressions like you know maybe I'm inflamed right now or maybe it's the depression and I'm kind of like well like that's sort of the whole point here is that we're not really drawing that distinction. It's more like there is no such thing as the depression, like this, you know, genetic from on high, like destiny. It's more like you have these depressive symptoms, but they're related to things like inflammation. Certainly with bipolar, um, you know, like my bipolar patients, it's an identity. They're like, I have bipolar, I am bipolar, I will always be bipolar. And I think that, yes, you will always have that vulnerability, that predisposition. But um, I have yet to find a bipolar patient that isn't significantly inflamed in one way or another. And whether it's that they have an autoimmune thyroid issue and that's really responsible for most of their bipolar symptoms, or there's just really disturbed gut ecology, or sometimes there's things like a parasite or Lyme disease, and you know, something that's causing sort of chronic systemic inflammation. And this is how their brain manifests that kind of inflammation is with these bipolar symptoms. And so there is always this um, there's a puzzle to solve for kind of like what aspect of your physical body and maybe your psychology, like your, your thought patterns, and maybe even like on some level like a spiritual dimension, like what aspect of this has gotten out of balance and what can we do to just gently push it back into balance so that you're not so symptomatic. But, you know, that works in the maintenance phase and once somebody is like acutely manic and not able to care for themselves, um, it's not the time to go, you know, exploring those right. avenues. Yeah, it's just like get get safe quickly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're somebody watching this video and you yourself have some sort of a mental illness or think you might have some symptoms um, or a family member or a close friend and you're not in New York and maybe, you know, you can't get to you or somebody like you, like, what? You know, how do you, where do you start to try to find this kind of care that really tries to look at the root cause and, and see the whole body as a connected piece? Yeah, I would say, thank God we're in the age of the internet because um, I, I think it's helpful to find a good, like, integrative or holistic or functional psychiatrist, especially if you're on medication and you're open to thinking about, like, wanting to do a medication taper, you'd want to always do that under supervision. So you'd want to find somebody who gets this and knows how to do that responsibly and safely and like keep you safe through that process. Um, but if you actually just want to start to create more wellness in your life, like you don't really need the fancy New York City psychiatrist. Like it's pick up a book like The Paleo Cure by Chris Kresser or Kelly Brogan's book, A Mind of Your Own, um, or even just start to like search the free online content on Chris Kresser's website or just, you know, all of these different um, kind of ancestral health, you know, there, there are a lot of different approaches, but people that talk about how do you eat real food, how do you heal your gut, how do you rehabilitate your sleep, um, how do you build a little bit of natural movement into your day-to-day -day life, um, that's really the process. So, you know, it's, it's great if you have like a psychiatrist who understands that, but if you don't, you can do this on your own. I wouldn't say you can get yourself off medication on your own. I think it's just too dangerous. It's too difficult. Um, but I think that everything other than that, you can really make a lot of that progress on your own. Uh, and you know, if you don't live somewhere where there are holistic psychiatrists, probably there are, maybe there's a naturopath or an integrative physician or maybe a functional medicine doctor. So all of these different approaches, they'll help you get where you need to go. It's you know, all the people that are going to think about root cause and think about gut health and think about how do you eat and how yeah. do you actually treat your body right. So it sounds like I mean, there's a lot people can do for themselves, but in a you know somebody who is medicated could potentially try to find somebody who understands the thought process of trying to get to the root cause and sort of heal the body as a whole and maybe get that person to work together with their psychiatrist to really you know sort of um, wean them off the meds slowly or, or come up with a plan so that you know they can sort of get back to, yeah. to themselves. In a perfect world that works, yeah. Sometimes yeah. you'll encounter psychiatrists who will have a lot of resistance about any of these approaches, so. Yes, I've, I believe that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a big part of Welby's mission is to inform, which we're doing right now, um, but also to 
uh, inspire people to sort of make changes when maybe they thought this was just their, you know, the, the sentence for the rest of their lives. They had to just, you know, take this pill or that, that they were always going to have this, you know, constipation issue or this mental health issue or whatever. Um, are there any stories you can talk about sort of anecdotally that you just love having seen in your practice? Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is what's so fun about what I do. It's, um, and I'll speak very generally just to protect everybody's privacy, but um, I have a patient who has been on, um, like, uh, she's been on psychiatric medications, I think since she was five, and, um, and, and she's now almost off of them. And so it's, you know, just, it, she's been very disciplined about diet and lifestyle, and she's created the conditions to be able to get off of medication. She's stable and resilient on her own. Um, I have lots and lots of patients who have come in to see me with anxiety of various forms. And anxiety is one of my favorite things to treat because there's so much low hanging fruit in anxiety and it's like blood sugar stabilization alone. Like I've, I feel like I've had a, a nice, maybe a dozen patients over the years who have come in having panic attacks like daily, like all the time. And when I look at their diet, it's like they're eating in this way. It's like the typical American way of trying to be a good citizen, eat low fat and da 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 and lots of salad and it's like, what we've done is we've created like really uh, unstable blood sugar. And so for those patients, I'll have them do things like take a spoonful of almond butter or coconut oil every few hours and start to shift the way they eat towards like more real foods, more substantial foods, more healthy fats, more pastured meats and you know, just more protein in that form, less grain, less refined carbohydrate. And once they've stabilized their blood sugar, which usually can happen over the course of a few months or not even, like it can take a few weeks, um, there's just no more panic attacks at all. It's just like that huge, enormous life-defining problem, just done. Um, and it's not always that easy for everybody, but there's definitely been a lot of people over the years that it was that easy. Um, and so that's really rewarding. And depression, I think my, the, the most, like one of the most fulfilling parts of the work that I do is helping people realize that there's hope. Um, realizing that there's like a more empowering uh, way to think about mental health, that it isn't this destiny, it's not genetic, it's not the fixed mindset, it's like, that's just the story we've been sold through a lot of like, you know, well-meaning, misguided accidents of like how we think about mental health. Um, but so to help someone see like, oh, you know, that's true. My depression did start right around the time that I took that course of antibiotics for that sinus infection in college and went on birth control pill. And it's sort of like then you start to see that this had a physical basis all along. And you have to work to get that physical basis back to balance. But once you do, the depression is just no longer a part of your life. So this thing that we think of as like our identity and it's like, okay, I'm depressed and I'll always be depressed. It just doesn't have to be so. Wow, that's I'm inspired already. That's really that's really cool. Yeah. Especially the I'm thinking of a few friends right now who have to take anti-anxiety medications, and I'm can't wait to, to ask them about their blood sugar. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the second piece of that is uh, well, these you know dual mission is also to what we say um, demand a system that supports you, and that means that you know, at the time that you're trying to do all these things to heal yourself and do things every single day to prevent and, you know, reverse chronic disease, to also maybe make some, you know, some dents in, in the system so that there's change for, for future generations so that they're not, you know, every time they go out to a restaurant, they're not fighting an uphill battle mm -hmm. or they go into a, a conventional doctor and they're being thrown antibiotics for something that might be viral and, you know, therefore sort of messing up their gut. Um, so what would you say, this is super hard to answer, but is, you know, one or two of the most significant changes you can think of in the system that, you know, people could try to sort of fight for either by, you know, calling their Congress people or supporting a particular brand or something like that? That's interesting. I'm not sure I have a good answer to that. Let me think. I mean, what comes to mind, I'm focused on food right now in my mind. One would be like to actually shop at your farmer's market, which sounds like a little like a Portlandia solution, but um, I think that like, like with everything, we're very marketed to in terms of our ideas about food. And so most of my friends, it's like we're, I'm at this age where everyone's got parents and everyone shops at, you know, they wouldn't feed their kid bad food. Like we all grew up eating McDonald's, but now everyone is feeding their kid 
organic Annie's mac and cheese, right? And it's right. like, well, oh, but it's organic. And it's like, but, you know, and I think that even just these layers of like realer and realer versions of real food is where we need to get. And so, and it's not so hard. It's really just that I would say something being organic at the grocery store isn't necessarily good enough. And I think like a smaller farm is usually better. And you sort of want to see that this is um, like not a loveless project. Like I think that there's, you know, Agribusiness is kind of a loveless way of making the food that nourishes us, and I think organic has now gotten so big that there are even ways of producing beautiful organic food that's still kind of a loveless pursuit. So you want to go to your farmer's market, and you want to have a relationship with the people that are like growing this food, and you just want to know that like this is, that's their vocation, like it's their calling, and this is what they're here to do. And so when you're taking that food home and chopping it and feeding it to your baby and feeding it to yourself, like there's just like a lot more positive intention every step of that way. And I think that matters because I'm like basically, you know, a witch. <laughs> and, um, and then I think that, um, you know, it, this is different for everyone, but I like to have conversation, like really annoying conversations with restaurants. And I used to like want to just like crawl under the chair when like I would be in a position of having to ask a question like, is that gluten free or like, is that dairy free? Or, and I, yeah. like, I didn't want to be that guy having those conversations at restaurants. But now I realize like, you know, you're taking one for the team a little bit by asking the restaurant, like, what kind of cooking fat do you use? Like, right. is this all just like GMO canola oil? And, or is this like, are you using lard or beef tallow or ghee or butter? And, you know, the answer is almost always actually GMO canola oil. Like even at fancy restaurants, even at sort of health food restaurants, um, if I open a restaurant, I'd find it really hard to not just use GMO canola oil. It's so much cheaper. It's a better high heat cooking oil. It's just like, it's, a, it's kind of a no brainer from their perspective, but it's inflammatory and totally damaging to our health. And so um, I've started to kind of vote with my feet and my dollars towards the restaurants that do make a point to use real cooking fat um, so that when I eat there, it's like I actually am nourishing my body and not getting inflamed. So that's, those places are few and far between. Um, they're going to be small. They're going to be, you know, it's, there, there's a lot of, it's just not an optimized system to serve people food cooked with real fat. Um, but like spend your time, your money, your dollars at the places that do bother to do that. Yeah. yeah no, I think, um, at Welby, we made this video on choosing the eggs that are healthiest for you, um, a little like animated uh, infographic video. And at the end, we sort of say like, it's a little uncomfortable, but you may want to ask when you go to a restaurant, if you're going to pay up for, you know, quality, nutritious eggs that we've just talked about, and then you go have brunch somewhere and don't think twice about the eggs that they're serving. And they're, you know, likely to be quite low quality because of the cost of, you know, restaurant and making margins and all that. It's it's probably worth speaking up. It's going to be uncomfortable at first, but you know nothing will change really unless yeah. you say something. Yeah. So putting pressure but, on these restaurants. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully that will drive some systemic change if sort of you know everybody does it. So basically, don't be shy. Have the Portlandia conversation of like, what's this chicken's name? Where did it come from? And like that's <laughs> that's kind of what you have to do, and it's super annoying, um, and everyone else around you will roll their eyes. But it's like how we actually start to encourage our restaurants to feed us food that's nourishing and not damaging our health. Yeah, definitely. And maybe even if you have time or um, you were, you know, a little awkward about doing it at the table with people you don't know, just grabbing the manager on the way out yeah. and saying, like, thank you for the meal. I was just curious about, you know, what, what I was being served and it would, you know, mean a lot for my health and my family's if you might, you know, um, have some more nutritious ingredients and that could yeah, you, can, you can have that conversation on the slide. One other yeah. thing is that you can, we can all do this even without the Portlandia conversation is to be a factory farm vegetarian. I think that's one of the most important things that all of us can do, like start this today, um, which is basically, you know, you can eat meat, but like when you're eating meat, when you're eating fish, you're sourcing it really, really well from places with responsible animal husbandry. And this is like a healthy animal and a healthy process. The factory farm system of like, you know, that whole process of, of delivering meat to our plates, it's a pretty disturbed industry and these are, it's unethical and it's, these are sick animals. It's not good for your body. It's not good like for these animals and their welfare. And so I think that um, you basically just don't eat any eggs or meat or poultry or fish that's coming from this kind of environment. And that usually is in the restaurant. That's where that happens. So you can source the kind of food that you want when you're at home, but then when you're in a restaurant, 
unless the menu was like you know saying in bold italics like this is from like peekaboo farms you know then it's, <laughs> it's not and they would be telling yeah. you if it was and so um, you basically just assume like you know when in doubt that this is unhealthy meat and you order vegetarian at the restaurant um, and eat meat later at home if you really want to um, but that's one way to sort of just that's one thing that you can do without any Portlandia conversations that help like just not feed into an industry that's making us sick and making animals suffer. Right. So Ellen, I want to also ask you about ADHD and ADD. Um, it seems like half the people I know have this uh, condition and a lot of children I know too, which to me is really sad and scary and um, certainly a defining characteristic of our generation. Um, do people really, what, what, what is it? And why do so many people have these prescriptions? And you know, what is this doing for their long-term health? Yeah, yeah, I used to work at a primary care uh, group and I basically often felt like I was just the Adderall dispenser, like the local Adderall dispenser and just every patient would come in and it's like, I, you know, I need a refill on my Adderall. Um, and it did feel like half of New York was on Adderall. Um, so it's an issue. I would never say dismissively like ADHD is not a thing. I actually believe it's a thing. Um, I just don't agree with that idea of like, like we've been talking about, like that someone was born with Adderall deficiency disorder. I think that it's one of these multifactorial issues where um, in the kids, I think that I always want to think first about gut health and inflammation um, and sugar. So you sort of think about like, is something off with their gut health? Are they eating a food that they don't tolerate? Are they eating a lot of sugar? And is that just making their brain like fireworks all the time? Um, and so with kids like that, you can start to make little adjustments to their diet. You can do things like probiotics, a little bone broth, a little ghee, a little sauerkraut, just like gentle gut healing. And that can make a big difference in ADHD symptoms in kids. In adults, um, I also focus on all of those issues. But I often think of like true blue adult ADHD to me is a sleep disorder until proven otherwise. And sleep disorder can mean a lot of different things. It can mean everything from like sleep apnea to like a true blue kind of like, you know, sleep disorder where like their brain does not go through the proper architecture of sleep overnight. Um, or even to the kind of like self-imposed sleep disorder of like you just don't go to bed in time. And so, um, when someone's willing to work with me on this, uh, my patients with adult ADHD, once we've cleaned up their diet, it's really about like, can you sleep on like a wholesome Midwestern schedule of like, can you get to bed early, like early, early, and can you kind of sleep through the night and wake up early? Um, and does that actually solve most of the ADHD symptoms? And for a handful of patients, it really does. Um, so that's how I think about that. The stimulants, they work. It's like we have this issue with mental health medications, which is that a lot of them aren't even actually effective, right? So we know that antidepressants don't separate from placebo in the treatment of mild to moderate depression. So it's like everyone's on these meds and are they actually doing anything? And they're doing something because placebo does something. So it's like you know you're taking something and you feel a shift, um, which would be fine if they didn't have the potential to cause harm. So like a benign, a harmless placebo is a great thing, but that's not what SSRIs are. Um, whereas things like the stimulants, this is no placebo. Like these are powerful medications, they work. Um, but they, I, I'm really concerned with the long-term issues. Uh, I have a lot of patients who have been on stimulants for years, decades, since childhood. And what you see, the adult picture of that is someone who is, there's a real psychological and physiologic dependency on the medications. I hear a lot, like I can't even get out of bed in the morning without taking my Adderall or Vyvanse or Ritalin or Concerta. Um, and then I'll, I'll see people that kind of try and fail to get off of it. And that's like, like a really rough experience. People will try to get off of it. They'll be glued to their couch for a whole weekend. They'll feel depressed. They'll want to eat everything that's not pinned to the floor. It's like a really uncomfortable experience to go through. And a lot of patients really struggle with it and, and sort of it takes them months or even years to figure out how to get off of stimulants. Um, and you see a lot of like, you know, I, for lack of a better term, like adrenal fatigue or just burnout or what I think of as just someone's fried. And I think it makes sense that after years of stimulant use, it's like 
you've basically given yourself this false energy or false alertness um, and it doesn't come from nowhere so it's like if you're getting good sleep and good nourishment then okay you can be a high performer but if you're not getting good sleep not getting good nourishment and you're on because you know Adderall is making you on then you're sort of stealing that energy from somewhere and it kind of you see people sort of have this come up and later where like they're just so depleted from all of these years of being so high performing on this medication um, and then you'll also, I'll see people that who their guts are really messed up and I think that's actually related to stimulants and this idea, it goes back to like high school freshman year biology class where you learn about um, your parasympathetic nervous system which is like rest, digest, repair um, and then there's the sympathetic nervous system which is like fight or flight and you can't really repair unless you're relaxed, if you're in that parasympathetic tone. If you're taking a stimulant, you're by definition in this fight or flight state. So if you're on that medication, you're in that fight or flight state all day, every day, something goes off with your gut, which so commonly happens, then there's never really an opportunity to heal. So I'll see people on stimulants have like a really disordered gut ecology. They'll have things like SIBO, they'll have things like, um, you know, dysbiosis in their, in their large intestine. And um, there's really just no healing that until they're off the stimulant because their body needs to be able to be in that parasympathetic tone, rest, digest, repair. Um, wow. So yeah, they, these medications are not benign. Um, I don't dispute that some people really have true blue ADHD symptoms. I just, I just think that there's a better way of managing it. Yeah. And, and I hope that people can learn about that alternative so they can do that before getting themselves on this path of years yeah. of medication. I, you were describing somebody coming off of it and I had a friend go through that and I was so proud of her that she decided to do this at, it was like 32 years old, but I think she'd been on it since you know middle school or high school, something like that, and it was really intense for her, but she's, she's fine, she's thriving and she's herself again and I think a lot of people don't want to go through that um, but you know when you do to just be prepared that um, it's gonna be hell but then you're gonna be you yeah. know, great on the it's on like, side. It's like labor, it's hard and you can do it. <laughs> it's like it's really really long and hard, it can be a difficult process. So what would you say the impact of sort of recreational or occasional <laughs> use of these drugs is on people who don't really need them per se but just want to you know perform more than they or better than they would you know the thought that came over me was one of like schadenfreude it's like you know fine if you want to play around with that like be my guest but it's not gonna like it doesn't serve you long term yeah, um, yeah I think that it's like there's just no free lunch like you don't really get to be like you know run faster jump higher outperform the other lawyers at your law firm it comes from somewhere so like these are trade-offs and if it's really like your priority is like you just want to be as like cognitively optimized you know then yeah use Adderall like it'll help you do that um, will it start to impact your health your mood your like long-term ability to have energy and be able to focus on your own like it will so like it's it's your choice yeah, I guess thanks. well this was so interesting, and I know you have to go, but thank you so much for sitting down with us and sharing all of this really, really helpful information. I know that mental illness is correlated to so many other chronic diseases and just is such a, a serious and expensive piece of the chronic disease crisis, especially in the U.S., but globally. So I think if there were more psychiatrists like you, we would start to figure out not only the mental health piece, but so many other pieces of of preventing and reversing chronic disease. So thank you. Thank you, Adrian.